E, they're definitely going to pave the way, prepare the way for the Antichrist. And now getting involved with this great reset with Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum, it's keep your eyes peeled. But the metaverse, which Mark Zuckerberg have opened up, it opened up a very scary realm uh, where virtual reality is going to now meet in real life. So there's going to be like an augmented reality. Virtual will coincide with the physical. So I've told you examples before that here in real life we might see vir virtual stuff amongst us. When you wear, that, when you wear those uh, glasses, that's how it's designed, where you see the real life world around you, but combine with that virtual imagery with that. So then you'll be touching virtual objects while in real life. So this is going to be very scary stuff. And the great narrative, it's all about that. The great narrative is all about the great reset and the metaverse. The whole idea is basically this. If you recall what the great reset is, it's that our civilization, our, te our current technology, current lifestyle needs to have a reset and when we reset all of this we're going to reset it to a way where it's going to be a much more advanced better technology combined with humanity because there's no doubt technology is interacting with the human world and the metaverse is evidence of that that they're paving a way that they're really going to push that so because the metaverse is doing this we have to understand that the Great Reset, this is something that they've always wanted to do. So then, their action, the World Economic Forum is basically ahead of the metaverse on this one. So because they're ahead of the metaverse in this one, they've discussed about the Great Narrative. And you might go, what is this Great Narrative now? So I've explained the Great Reset, the metaverse. The Great Narrative is this, is basically let us narrate how the world will play out. Right? That kind of sounds like the metaverse, right? Like you create your own life, you create your own universe. But this is going to be now real life. Real life, not just something virtual, but real life. So the great narrative is let us, humankind, real life, narrate our future on how we will become or what we will be. And obviously, technology is going to play a huge part in this one. So I'm going to uh, play you a recording, which is going to be pretty, pretty scary. And as I uh, explained to you from this recording about the great narrative, uh, this person explained the great narrative in a way which is very terrifying. So he took it from the World Economic Forum. And from the World Economic Forum, Glenn Beck explained everything of what they explained the great narrative to be. And this is like beyond the metaverse, you have to understand. All right, so I'm going to play it off of my phone and hopefully people can hear it from here. We are so far ahead on the metaverse and you don't even know it. I, I want to tell you that on Wednesday, uh, the World Economic Forum held the great narrative. And they've been promoting this. And what I'm going to read to you is on their website. Now, remember, the World Economic Forum just partnered with the Biden administration to bring these things back. They're to bring these things into America. We are now partnered with uh, 20 different companies, public, public private partnership and the World Economic Forum. This is build back better. So the great narrative was the uh, conference that is happening this week uh, to design the future. Now, I want you to just listen. This is how they opened it. Design the future, the story for the future. In order to shape the future, you have to imagine the future, design the future, and then execute. Over the next two days, they will decide how we decide, how we execute the great narrative. But the great narrative is, is, what is tomorrow going to look like globally? The world has gone through a very difficult time. People are now looking for transformation. But the world needs a new blueprint, a new narrative. Why? 
because 1% own more wealth than 7 billion. Almost half the population lives in under $6 a day because the last 60 years were the warmest on record. We can't afford to waste more time on denial of climate change because our digital world will be as important as our physical world. By 2025, there will be five times more devices than people on this planet. Because both to inspire hope and action, government, first and foremost, are in the business of installing hope. Mm. Governments are instituted among men to... Oh, protect these rights. I'm sorry, I thought it was um, install hope. Imagine what role the government should play to install this new narrative. A whole government approach is not enough. All of humanity approach is needed. Collectively, we are the author of this new chapter. The future belongs to those who can imagine it and implement it. How can we design the government to be future citizen ready? How to lead the world into sustainable and a better future? What will be the great narrative? When we look at the world today, difficulties shape the future. Three obstacles. First, after the pandemic, people have become much more self-centered. Really? That's a big... Hmm. What role is... What is the role of government? Looking at our current position in human history, we sit at the second of the first minute of the first day of the first year. Human evolution to the wheel to today with technology. In 50 years, it will be totally different. The pace we've grown has been massive, but we are putting our life onto one platform. The future will be based on the platform we design now. Does anybody think so far this is a little spooky? The job is to bring people and humility together. Hmm. And humility. How is this great government going to make us find humility? Technology. Uh, let's say, let's see. Uh, the job is to bring people and humility together. Technology and to bring uh, and to bring better for our humanity. Obviously translated. Uh, how do you see the global future collaboration? Hopefully, in optimistic terms. We know the world isn't inclusive or sustainable enough, but we cannot forget the amount of progress made in 50 years. We know the tensions like USA and China, but we have always have common interests. They want stronger cooperation between the U.S. and China, including environmental issues. Don't leave it alone to governments. Business and science need to play a part. Combine the common interest. Make short-term compromises for long-term change. We are in a new transformation of humankind. If you want to change humanity, we must change the world. Let us use our energy to create a great narrative for humankind in the next two days. Take our own fate into our own hands. So that's from the World Economic Forum that Glenn Beck was reading. So I don't know if you caught everything that he said, but the idea is this. The idea that you notice is that government and then the business, they have to play a part and they have to dictate our future. They have to create the future for us. So then they, uh, they really push a role on government on this one. And that technology, and since they're the ones creating this platform, this digital, this virtual era for all of us, Mankind is going to have to learn to coincide, to interact with that to, in order to have a successful future. But they're pushing a lot of government on this. So what's the pointer right here? The pointer is when you have government power taking charge of technology and, te and all of mankind being consumed by technology, then what do you get? You get the Antichrist kingdom right there. You get it where... All of mankind is consumed by a technology culture. It becomes a part of our life that government who 
paved the way for this one. They're in charge of this. They have a huge hand in this one. They can even control us. So in other words, they can make you put this technology on all of you one day. But they're already doing that. Because think about this. Metaverse will change all of civilization and culture. Mankind will become a part of that. Technology will become part of human life. It will become a part of human life. But see, Zuckerberg's the one that's doing that, and then Microsoft. Do you recall that government, they don't want these tech giants to be in charge? They want to be in charge. And uh, I'm going to read you some cases right here, but uh, there are... That's why everyone is arguing at the new, stupid news media because they're so stupid. They're not intellectual. I don't know why you read that garbage. They keep pushing and arguing government has to take charge of the internet, of technology, so that they can offer that some sort of platform, technological thing, database for the public to use. Why? So government can take charge of technology that we use? And if we use this technology as a part of our life, you, all you need is one guy to come out. His name is Antichrist to just be in charge of that government. And he's got his mark of the beast set up, his technology set up that he can control everybody. That's scary. That's very scary. Let me give you a few articles to think about that. The metaverse. You know what it's described about Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse? This is from a bunch of gaming people. From an article from Games Beat, they said this. The title of the article is, The Metaverse Will Feel Alive Once Storytelling, like narrating, becomes story living. The great narration is this, is that they're not just going to narrate or tell you how the world will become. You're going to live in it. That's the great narrative. So if that's the great narrative, already... People in the gaming world knows that the metaverse is going to become like that. It's already a what? A narrative. A storytelling thing where you can create stuff. But it's not just you creating the story, creating the game. You're living in it. That's scary. The great narrative is what they say, what they tell you the story, you're going to live in it. But who's the one telling the story? Is it really the people or is it... Big, big government. Yeah, when they have in charge of that, they then have the power to narrate your life, so to speak. All right, you all follow me so far? That's scary. Here's an article from uh, the trustworthy news source that you all love, MSNBC. All of them are saved people too, you have to understand. You know? They're all saved, they're going to heaven. You know? what, did, what did these dumb idiots say? They say this in their article. Policy makers seeking to rein in big tech also need to be careful that they don't harm small startups and nonprofit organizations in the process, both in the interest of maintaining a competitive technology marketplace as well as to protect the vibrant and open Internet. It may even be time to consider... It may even be time to consider what a, not private technology, private use, private internet, private technology, what a public internet would look like. And how governments might be able to offer some online services to the public as alternatives to private technology platforms. We don't live in the metaverse yet, but it's disturbing to think that any of us would eventually live in a world entirely controlled by a loosely regulated technology company like Facebook or Meta. You know, they have a point here because if um, Facebook, Meta, takes control of this metaverse that you're living in, who's the one dictating for you? Just like YouTube, Facebook, social media is already dictating you what information is correct to them. Yeah. And then people are living by that information, too. But imagine the metaverse much more. But this is worse. These stupid liberals are saying, imagine a private company do that. I would, prob I would prefer that a private sector more than stupid government. Yeah. You think that's safer? No, because then government has control of everything. 
At least private sectors, you got competition in different companies. But imagine government taking control of all of that. They know this. That's why MSNBC, their title of their article is Facebook's Metaverse Evolution is Very Scary. Why? Because they know how much power it would have for one company to rule people's lives, basically. But imagine when you have government. What's the Antichrist system? It's a, it's a government system. It's a socialist Marxist type of culture combined with an advanced technology. That's what's going to happen one day. Wow, so then you see the metaverse colliding with the Great Reset. Now go to Psalms 73. Let me show you something here. Let me show you some interesting scriptural references from Psalm 73. Now, when we, uh, before I read you this text, though, I want to share a few more uh, articles with you about this Marxism setup. It's a Marxism setup. We know that it's an elite setup as well, right? We see that. It's Marxist. It's elitist. So rich people, the powerful, they're the ones who control. This metaverse might be more related to the great narrative of the Great Reset. Klaus Schwab and Mark Zuckerberg may be more closely intertwined than you think, actually. You might say, how so? Well, for some of you who don't know, it's so interesting that uh, the, great narrative, uh, the great narrative is actually something that was discussed by uh, philosophers and great minds a long time ago. The great narrative, the idea that we see so far, if you listen to the World Economic Forum, you see government having a hand in it, right? And they're the ones that tell you the story, right? They're the ones that tell you the story. So then, actually, this is very similar. I wonder... Klaus Schwab, who's a big part in speaking all of this, I wonder if I might tie to something more Marxist than you think. Well, I'm, did you look at Klaus Schwab's life? You didn't, huh? You stupid news media reporters do ad hominem arguments and you dig up dirt in all other people's lives so that you can sully their reputation, but you don't look at your big, fat, elitist cats. And if you look, dig up dirt in their lives, you would go, whoa. I don't trust this guy as far as my left foot is concerned. So let me tell you a few things that you didn't know before. First of all, this great narrative that some of you didn't know was also known as something as the grand narrative. Now, for some of you who don't know the grand narrative, you can actually look at a YouTube video, Philo Notes, and they're the ones that can explain it really well about the grand narrative. The grand narrative is actually meaning functions to legitimize power, authority, and social customs, customs. Basically, authoritarians use great narratives to legitimize their own power. And what they do at the same time, it's, it's an attempt to translate alternative accounts into their own language and to suppress all objections to what they themselves are saying. So this great narrative, for some of you who didn't know, it's the same thing as the grand. It's a, just another wording for the grand narrative. And grand narrative is very, very Marxist. Klaus Schwab, he probably didn't have that in mind when he said great narrative. Actually, do you know who his teacher was? Henry Kissinger. You know who Kissinger is? Part of the Trilateral Commission. You know, part of that globalist, elitist setup, Trilateral Commission. He was part of that. You didn't know that, did you? Oh, by the way, you know who uh, uh, Kissinger, uh, for some of you who didn't know about that one, he was part of the Trilateral Commission, but he was advisor to guess who? Rockefellers. Wow. They're all tied. There's a Marxist mindset right here. Marxist mindset about this one. An example of a grand narrative that you're going to find out is 
Marxism, believe it or not. Marxism is one of the examples given for the grand narrative. Authorita authoritarians legitimizing their own power and then the, the story that they narrate or they use. They're going to make society revolve around that. Marxism creates a society in which all individuals can develop their talents to the fullest. That's an example of a grand narrative, they say. But it's so interesting that a French uh, author or a philosopher, a French mindset, Jean-François uh, Lyotard, he said this, science has always been in conflict with narratives. So it contradicts science. You didn't know this? The Davos Agenda, that's part of the World Economic Forum, all right? For some of you who didn't know where Klaus Schwab is from. The, Davo the Davos Agenda, you know what they said at 2015? All right, so remember, review, grand narrative. Basically, it was critiqued as base, that science has been in conflict with the narratives. But then, the Davos Agenda said, at 2015, a good narrative, a good narrative soundly beats even the best data. Where, where, what in the world? Where are these guys coming from? Unless where they go to school from. Who are they learning from? It's some, there's something Marxist, socialist there. And these are the big guys that you want to trust to rule your world? You, you're telling me that they're totally non-biased. They're, they're not going to give some kind of Marxist influence on your society? Oh, don't kid me. Go kid your grandmother. I mean, it's the same thing. If you dug up my history, where did I go to school? And then uh, you're going to tell me, I'm not going to give you any of my bias when I teach you. Of course I'm going to give you what I learn, what I'm biased toward. That's why you guys are watching me online. You know what I'm biased toward? The Word of God. Amen. Oh, ridiculous people. Lyotard, the French thinker, argued this. The grand narrative has lost its credibility. Regardless of what mode of unification it uses, regardless of whether it is a speculative narrative or a narrative of emancipation. But, uh, you know, the WEF, the World Economic Forum, it's all about emancipation. It's all about, you know, creative, uh, creativeness or imagination, as Mark Zuckerberg would call it, right? Imagine, imagine a world. It's all clouded with that. Davos Agenda 2015, it says this, in the battle for hearts and minds of human beings, narrative will consistently outperform data in its ability to influence human thinking and motivate human action. That's very similar to what Lyotard uh, critiqued about the grand narrative, where Marxism is an example. And you're telling me this great narrative that these guys are doing is not... They don't share a relationship. They, where did they get that idea from? They got, why did they call it great narrative? Grand narrative? See that? They learned it from some garbage out there. They learned it from these guys. Scary stuff. Very scary stuff. Another thing is, from the Davos Agenda 2015, a false dichotomy has emerged between the use of narrative and data analysis either can be equally misleading or helpful in conveying truth about causal effects. They also, Klaus Schwab has said this in 2021. The pandemic has revealed the acute need to focus on the future and long-term health of our societies. So notice right here that there is a Marxist type of thinking. With these people. There is no doubt about it. More about Klaus Schwab for some of you who didn't know about this guy. When they had held their uh, meeting about the great narrative, one of the people who spoke in that meeting said this, all right? Let's see if you feel encouraged by this. I think the person's name is Nagar Woods. I'm not sure if I'm mispronouncing the person's name, but the person says this at that when talking about the great narrative. 
The good news is the elites across the world trust each other more and more. That's good news? When these guys are combining forces more and more? I, I, that's scary more. That brings more of your globalist agenda that you're thinking about more and more. They're uniting on something. They're... The bad news is that in every single country they were polling, the majority of people trusted their elites less. That's bad news. You know what they want the common people, you suckers, to do? They want you to trust their elites. They're going to build their false kingdom. You know what the person continues? So we can lead. Who's we? Who's we? Who's we? That's what the person's talking about. We elites. So we can lead. But if people aren't following, we're not going to get to where we want to go. Where we want to go. Where we narrate the future. See, it's all a Marxist setup. It's an elitist setup where you enter this new technology where humankind combines with technology. They want to be in control of everything. That's the idea. Wow, how about that? Some scary stuff. And then uh, Klaus Schwab, here's some other uh, chilling details that you didn't know about him. Didn't you know that uh, his father, Eugen Schwab, okay, and you can look up his life, all right? So this is his father. Already, you already got the chill from Klaus Schwab where his education, he got his learning from. It was from some globalist something that's Marxist, right? So already that should convince you enough, but his family roots would also scare you more to learn that Eugen Schwab, that uh, he was a well-known personality in Ravensburg as the managing director of the Esther Weiss factory. All right, when you look up that factory name, you know what it was? It was approved by Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich. Oh, wow. Esther Weiss Factory. He was elected as president of the Ravensburg Chamber of Commerce. And then, as a matter of fact, uh, Adolf Hitler, he, the, the Nazis, they even put some kind of approval on it. It was part of, uh, as, as their main... Uh, facility. It was actually given a branch title, awarded by the Nazi party, with the title National Socialist Model Company. National Socialist Model Company. Socialist, you know, socialist. Marxist socialism, right? But it's Nazi too. There's something darker going on behind the scenes. You don't, you trust these cats? You got to be crazy for trusting these cats to take charge of you. But I think I know what the Bible says about it. You didn't know this before? Look at the book of Psalms. That book will predict the future. All right, look at the book of Psalms 73. And the word of God reads here, this is all tribulation passage, okay? This is talking about the future of what will happen. The Bible reads at verse hmm, 6, Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. So these are referring to wicked people who are very rich and prosperous. All right, aren't these people wicked at the same time very rich and prosperous? Isn't this what Psalms is talking about, these people? Well, let's keep reading. They are corrupt. Yeah, aren't they corrupt? And speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. Look at that. They speak loftily. They try to deceive you with words, but it's oppressing you. They want to control you. Why, who is the Bible talking about? They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. See that? They're the ones speaking out for the people. Like a narrative, right? They're narrating. 
The Bible, uh, you know, these people are described at verse 11. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? That's right. These people don't believe. They deny in a holy, awesome God, if your King James Bible, about a God of judgment. They're ignorant about that. They don't care about that. They're their own gods. They're the ones who are going to bring in the kingdom, right? Here's another one. Verse 12, Behold, these are the who, ungodly, who prosper in the world, they increase in riches. See, this is talking about elites. The book of Psalms is talking about the elites. But then notice right here that uh, the Bible keeps reading concerning about, uh, we can see that this is tribulation reference when we see at verse uh, 26 and 27 where in the future the Lord is rescuing the children of Israel who are under persecution from their enemies and he's going to have their enemies perish. This is all second advent tribulation passage. But let's see what else God says about them. He says in verse 19, how are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. Now look what they are, what's described about them. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their what? What do you mean their image? Do they have an image that these wicked elites will worship? Yeah, Revelation 13, the Antichrist sets up his image. But uh, wait a minute, whoa, what's also called, what makes a big deal about images? The metaverse. You have images there. And the Bible says God despise the elites with their what? The elites want to take charge of what? This. Isn't that what the news media is pushing to? Government, uh, take charge of this one. And God says he's going to despise their image. By the way, you, isn't this so interesting? There, the Bible also says that all of this described about the ungodly who are increasing in their riches, who are taking control and oppressing the poor, God says all of that is like a dream. And God one day, he's going to wake, uh, it's going to, God's going to one day, like a, wake up all of a sudden and disturb their dream. You know what this is all described as? A dream. It's a dream world. It's their fantasy world. Wow. Isn't it very interesting? You know what the point of Psalms is? Psalms is predicting to you the future. It's predicting to you a future that basically, it didn't say metaverse, and didn't say technology, or like some kind of avatar, or something like that, but what did it tell you? It told you this, there's going to be elitist who's going to oppress the poor through their narrative, through their words. And then all of it is going to be like a dream to them. And God says he's going to despise their image. Why, you see it already right now. Don't we have elitists right now who are creating their dream world through their narration, producing their images? How about that? Look at Proverbs chapter... Uh, also look at the book of Proverbs. Open up your Bibles to the book of uh, Proverbs. Chapter 28. Proverbs 28. You know, before you listen to uh, these rich people, to what government says, they always lie to you. Remember that. And you might say, well, they know what they're talking about. They know what they're talking about. You know, if you, uh, because these people are more rich than you, more powerful than you, and they seem to have higher intellect, intelligence than you, and all that kind of stuff, you know what? You're a gullible fool. You know what the Bible says? I'll tell you what the Bible says. These people are wise in their own conceit. That's what, oh, I'm so smart. Klaus Schwab and uh, Zuckerberg and all these people. We're very smart people. The government. Obama graduated from Harvard or whatever. We're all very smart people, you know? So because we're all very s smart people, then you should listen to us. Listen to the science. Listen to the science. These are the same people that want the narratives to outrun, outrun the science. They want to narrate. They want to change the world. You know what the Bible says? You shouldn't listen to them. You know what the Bible says you should be doing? He warned you about this long ago. 
but you didn't read your Bible. Verse 11, the rich man is wise in his own conceit, but the poor that hath understanding what? Searcheth him out. We question. Oh, excuse me, this, these rich, powerful elites are censoring us. We're trying to search out the truth. We're trying to, so we ask questions. You know, uh, there seems to be something wrong here. What about this? What about that? And then you know what they do? They censor, they ban you. That's the rich doing that. But that's the job of us poor common people. We have to search you guys out. That's what the Bible told us to do. And what are you rich people doing? You're wise in your own conceit. Oh, no, no. It's not science. You don't know what you're talking about. It's all just misinformation, fake news. And then they're wise in their own conceits. Scripture predicts human nature more than you think. Look at Revelation 18. Look at Revelation chapter 18. So then I'm like, okay, so obviously the Antichrist, he has to have business leaders. So these business leaders, there's no doubt they're paving a way for the Antichrist kingdom. So will the Antichrist have business leaders siding with him? Yes. So then there are business leaders. However, the Bible does not call it, uh, you know, executives or CEOs or business leaders. But the Bible has a name for them. So I'm like, then, uh, who are these people who side in with the Antichrist? They're called merchants. One example is Revelation 6. The Antichrist people, the Bible says, the kings, the rulers, that's government, and merchants, those are your business leaders, God's going to come down for them and judge them at the second advent. And they cry for the rocks to fall on them at Revelation 6. That matches with Psalm 73, when God comes down and judges the rich. Amen. Why? Because the people who are poor in the tribulation, they can't buy or sell, they can't eat, unless they have this mark. So then, they're the merchants. And I'm like, okay, where are the merchants are found? Revelation 18, with mystery Babylon, right? Revelation chapter 18, verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth, there's your government, have committed fornication with her, and the merchants, there's Klaus Schwab, there's your business leaders, there's your tech giants, of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So this is part, they're all part of Babylon then. Now remember, who is Babylon? That is not USA. That is the Catholic Church, right? Amen. So I'm like, well, Scripture has to be fulfilled. So if Scripture has to be fulfilled, then these God, the Catholic Church has to play a part in this. So I don't know uh, how the Catholic Church plays a part in this, when I researched, I got shocked. And I was like, are you kidding me? I don't know if you heard about this event before, but it happened last year, which I didn't know about this. And they have their own website. The, it's called uh, Council uh, for Inclusive Capitalism. Council for Inclusive Capitalism. Council for Inclusive Capitalism. So I don't know if this is the right acronym, but the Council for Inclusive Capitalism, let me read you what they are, all right? And some of it is going to shock you. Our members are inspired by the teachings of Pope Francis, who has challenged leaders to bring concrete ideas and take decisive action to extend the benefits of the economic system to all people while protecting the planet. Wow. All right, we're not wow yet until I tell you the names. Klaus Schwab, you know uh, where he got his learning with Henry Kissinger? Club of Rome. You didn't know that, did you? Klaus Schwab, yeah, the, the guy who's speaking about the grand narrative. Did you study the Jesuit doctrines during, especially during the days when they went to South America and stuff like that? You know what kind of teaching they have? A communist socialist ideology. They use the book of Acts as their justification that, you know, everybody divided the shares equally to the church. Oh, but who's the guy in charge? It's not a secular government, it's the church. 
See that? Someone's in charge of the power. You know who started this? Council for Inclusive Capitalism? Big name? Rothschild. The one that a lot of people believe is like uh, the top of the chain of the globalist system and the elites. How about that? So Rothschild is the one that uh, guided and began the meeting. And uh, not only that, there's a lot more people here. You know who's also involved in this meeting? The ones who... So Lady Lynn, so it was uh, Lady Lynn Forrester de Rothschild. Now, she has what they call guardians, all right? So these are the guardians who join the uh, Council for Inclusive Capitalism. Rajiv Shah, guess he CEO of Rockefeller Foundation. I'm giving you big names right here. Former partner, he was also former partners of the Gates Foundation's AGRA, for some of you who didn't know. Oh, by the way, the Rockefeller just released a report called Reset the Table, meaning the moment to transform the U.S. food system. I just thought that you might be interested to know that. They're all, they all know together. Darren Walker is another one. CEO of what? Ford. For some of you who d dug up some silly stuff about the Ford and the conspiracies too. Here's another one. Uh, you know the, the uh, companies? All right. J&J <laughs> and, &J and Merck? Guardians. Wow. They got everybody in their pot. Oh, this includes guardians, includes CEOs of Visa, MasterCard, Bank of America, Alliance Insurance. Mark Caney, who's Carney, former Bank of England head. And I was like, the scripture is more real than we thought. The Catholic Church is getting all in one pot. But uh, this is just current, okay? I'm telling you current event, okay? Uh, the New York Times gives an example of that, but I would recommend to go to their official website. Then you'll see all those names there. Just look at our members, and then you'll find all those guys. That's the best evidence. But a simple one is the New York Times article, The Pope Blesses Business Plans. A new initiative brings the Vatican and CEOs together. But the best one is Avro Manhattan's book. And he will prove to you beyond a doubt that, these got, that the Catholic Church is Revelation 18 Babylon, where all the businesses, all the elites, will be under her tip and finger. Why do you think Revelation 17, they turn against her? They turn against their mommy. So much power, drunk on power. But this is by, uh, The Vatican Billions by Avro Manhattan, with the subtitle, 2,000 Years of Wealth Accumulation from Caesar to the Space Age. It is a must-have book. I recommend that book. And this guy was writing from early 1900s. He was an aristocrat, brilliant guy, majored in economics too. So you know what he wrote? This is going to shock you. Long quote. Here we go. The Vatican has large investments with the Rothschilds of Britain, France, and America with the Ambrose Bank, with the Credit Suisse in London and Zurich. In the United States, it has large investments with the Morgan Bank, the Chase Manhattan Bank, the First National Bank of New York, the Bankers Trust Company, and others. The Vatican has billions of shares in the most powerful international corporations such as Gulf Oil, Shell, General Motors, Bethlehem Steel, General Electric, International Business Machines, TWA, etc., at a conservative estimate, these amount to more than $500 million in the USA alone. Remember, this is early 1900s. One person calculated when he wrote Vatican Billions. One person claimed, I calculated, he actually meant a trillion. By today's estimate. Some idea of the real estate and other forms of wealth controlled by the Catholic Church 
may be gathered by the remark of a member of the New York Catholic Conference, namely that this that his church probably ranks second, or right, New York Catholic Conference, listen, that his church probably ranks second only to the United States government in total annual purchase. Just one of their Catholic organizations. Another statement made by a nationally syndicated Catholic priest perhaps is even more telling. The Catholic Church, he said, must be the biggest corporation in the United States. We have a branch office in every neighborhood. Our assets and real estate holdings must exceed those of Standard Oil, AT&T, and U.S. Steel combined. And our roster of uh, Duis paying members must be second only to the tax rolls of the United States government. The Catholic Church is the biggest financial power, wealth accumulator, and property owner in existence. She is a greater possessor of material riches than any other single institution, corporation, bank, giant trust, government, or state of the whole globe. The Pope, as a visible ruler of this immense amassment of wealth, is consequently the richest individual of the 20th century. No one can realistically assess how much he is worth in terms of billions of dollars. The scripture is proven to be true all the time, that the Catholic Church will be Babylon and that the merchants, that they'll be whale and that they are tied to her system. And I told you in the last teaching, the Catholic Church at the Vatican, they already were way ahead about the metaverse stuff. They were discussing stuff about that. Man, how about that? Your, your Bible's always way ahead of you. It's crazy. But look at that website, Council for Inclusive Capitalism. I encourage you to look at that. When you look at their membership, it will scare you. This is recent, up-to-date now. Avro Manhattan's early 1900, and I gave you a recent source for Council for Inclusive Capitalism. Why is that, it makes you wonder. Why is it that these people uh, with the Vatican, they're going to do something like this? Look at Psalms 12. Psalms 12. Now, how many of you know about the famous passage in Psalms 12 about the words of the Lord being preserved? Yeah, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them. That's not the righteous individual. That is referring to the words of God. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them, the words of God, from this generation forever. But do you know what the whole chapter is about? The whole chapter, for some of you who didn't know, is more prophetic than you think. The whole chapter is not about, listen up now, the whole chapter is not about the preservation of God's words. One of the verses is about the preservation of God's words, but it's a part of a larger context. Psalms 12 is about the prophetic future of what happened in the tribulation with the, with the Jews crying out to God for help, where the rich and wicked oppress the Jews in the tribulation. Verse 1, help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They, the wicked, speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak words, narration, the great, their great narrative. Flattering, right? And it's vain. Verse 3, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips. He's going to cut off their great narrative. Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail? Narration. A narrative, a good narrative will outrun data. With our tongue will we prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Create your own world. Imagine. Metaverse. You narrate the future, etc. See? Who will be our Lord? And that's what God's prophesying. God, God scripture is way ahead. They're doing their great narrative. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy. See, they oppress the common people, especially the tribulation saints who fall into that. Now will I arise, saith the Lord, 
I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. These proud, rich elites, they puff down at them, and then they use their words, their narrative, to put them down. But God says he's going to protect them. How? His sa their safety relies on his words, his narrative. God's great narrative is verse 6 and 7. That's the eye-opener. You have no idea that when God says he's going to preserve his words, you have no idea that was something prophetic too. He was talking about his narrative. That's going to... Because the whole context is outrunning the rich with their narrative. Why is the poor protected at the end? Why, are they, why can they stand? Why can they win at the end? Why would the Lord fight for them at verse 5? Because they rely on his narrative. You know what we're going by? His narrative. Amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Amen. Your life is dictated by this That's great right. narrative. That's, right. That's why Satan wants his men... That's why these people want to play God. You go by my narrative. Isn't that mind-blowing? Verse 6 and 7 is just meshed in between. It's not a totally new, different subject. It's part of it. Because the last verse, verse 8, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. See, these rich people with their narrative. It makes you look Psalms 12 more differently now. How about that? But guess what? If you critique this narrative right here and say that there's mistakes, you're the sucker that's going to follow their great narrative, aren't you? Right. You bunch of suckers, you. Right. You know how, uh, isn't it interesting that these conspiracy, these globalists, they start to take over the world more in their power? When? What timing? When the first modern Bible version came out. What did Dr. Ruckman say? You remember my church history class, History of Bible Believers? What did Dr. Ruttman say? When the world fell into apostasy. When they critiqued that book. Wow. That man's a prophet, I'm telling you. Hebrews 11. Go to Hebrews 11. You might say, really? God's narrative is that important? Yeah. Our very universe, not metaverse. Our very universe lives by his narration. By his word. But these evil people, they can't create their own universe through their narrative. They do a metaverse through their word, their narrative. You don't believe me? You think I'm stretching it? Go to Hebrews 11.3. The Bible says, through faith, we understand that the world, see that? Worlds. That's what mankind wants. They want to create their own worlds, right? Like a metaverse. But God's worlds were framed by the what? Word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. No wonder they made the metaverse and the great narrative follow along with that. They want to create their own worlds. Imagine our own narration. That's wickedness. That's evil. Evil, scary stuff. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. After all, who created the universe? What's his name? The Word. John 1. John 1. You know who the great narrator is? And sometimes you'll see that. They'll talk about the grand narrator in some philosophical circles or some stories that you hear about. They're referring that to some God. They're playing God. They're playing God, these people. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the what? Word. word. And the word was with God, and the word was what? God. God. Verse 3. All things were made by who? Amen. Him, the word. And without him was not anything made that was made. Amen. So Satan, he wants to imitate that. You notice that? He wants to imitate that. So, will Satan imitate that? Mm -hmm. Revelation 13. Why do you think your Bible says this? You know how you, look at Revelation 13. You know how he got the whole world? How he controlled the whole world? Through his narration. Through his narration, he controlled the whole world. That's what these guys want to do. Look at this, Revelation 13. Why? What happened? 
If you look at verse 4, the Bible says, And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? They worshiped him based on verse 5. And there was given unto him a what? Mouth speaking great narrative. Great things. Wow. Great things and blasphemies. And what? It's all contradicting God at verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Remember the steps of the great narrative? You know, you, you decide, right? You decide, you just, that's why they had that conference, to speak about it so that they can make decisions. And then what? Execute. So we make it come to pass. But it may have a, another meaning there. Look at what happens at verse 6. He, he narrates, verse 6, and then verse 7, executes. 7, 8, 9, 10. He executes. Tribulation saints get their head cut off. Yeah. How about that? That book is more alive than you think. Let me close it right here now. Uh, last gold mine, all right? This happened, remembered where? UAE, the Arab. The Muslim culture now is getting involved in this. As Islam, can they see this word over here? All right. So as Islam... When the Muslims get involved, they had their great narrative meeting over there at UAE, where the Muslims are now involved. Now, uh, remember, your pastor gave a theory. He's not sure. He mentioned that the false prophet might be a Muslim. The Muslims have a big play with the great narrative. Look at the false prophet. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, that, and he had two horns like a lamb. That's a false prophet. And he spake as a what? Dragon. dragon. He had the same narrative as the dragon. So you know what? If the false prophet is Muslim, then that means the Muslims have to somehow play a part with the great narrative, pushing that agenda. After all, it was the, the word of their prophet, the narrate the narrative of their prophet that they go by their religion. He didn't even write. He couldn't write Muhammad. He couldn't write a lick. All he did was blah, 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 his great narrative, and he was like a mental condition if you ever saw one, or demon-possessed. And then through his narrative, you have Islam. Wow. And the Quran, based on a narrative, is their final authority. They make a big deal about that. But we make a big deal about somebody's word. That's God's word. See, you know what Satan's doing? He's playing competition. My, the word of the devil versus the word of God. Let's see who wins the great narrative. We're in smack dab in the middle of it. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching has been incredibly eye-opening and sober to think about where we're heading toward and how powerful your word is. Such, such a great narrative, Lord. And may we abide by its principles and not go by the narrative of this wicked world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.